Hello, I'm Valerie Edwards, Assistant Editor at Fostering Families Today. Thanks for joining us. We continue our 2022 webinar series titled Tough Conversations with a look at how caregivers and biological families can successfully work together and navigate their relationship so that each acts in the best interest of the child, keeping in mind the end goal, reunification whenever possible. Today's webinar is sponsored by iFoster, and because you're with us today, we know you care deeply about improving our nation's foster care system. In 2021, more than 2,400 youth, caregivers, and frontline workers from across the country took the time to tell iFoster what's needed to improve foster care. Their voices are being heard, and now it's your turn. Please join this year's Voice of the Community survey available at voiceoffostercare.org. That's voiceoffostercare.org. Fostering Families Today is a bi-monthly publication dedicated to educating foster, adoptive, and kinship families. You can find us online at fosteringfamiliestoday.com and on the various social media platforms. But before we get started today, a quick question for our listeners. We wanna know what's on your mind. As we prepare for the year ahead, what topics do you want to hear about in our upcoming webinars? You can drop your comments in the chat below. And trust me when I tell you, we take your opinions very seriously here. Coming up, we'll meet a father separated from his daughter, but determined not to lose her. You'll also meet the couple who became the little girl's second family. And in Northern California, a team-based approach helps birth and resource families connect. Stay with us. Right now, our first guest says, if the first family and the foster, adoptive, or kinship family can work together, long-lasting relationships can be formed, and perhaps most importantly, trauma can be minimized. With an estimated 400,000 children in foster care nationwide, caring for those children takes a team-based approach. Everyone, everyone has got to be all in when it comes to putting the needs of the child first. Renee Bannis with Minnesota-based Ampersand Families joins us today. She is Ampersand's program supervisor for the 30 Days to Family program where by helping children stay connected to loved ones, she supports her team in an early and exhaustive family search. Renee, thanks for being with us for today's Tough Conversation. Thanks so much for having me here. I expect we're gonna have a good one, so I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be with us. You know, there was a time in social welfare when foster family and birth family at least 10 years ago, maybe even more, didn't meet, didn't exchange any information when they knew nothing about one another. When did this change and why did this change? Back then it was best practice, but things have changed. Well, I think that so many black and brown children are disproportionately um, in the child welfare system that I think it's really an equity issue. I know that in my own family with my own life experience, my mother is an adoptee um, and she's Ojibwe and grew up in a white family. And this was hard for her. And she personally struggled with this growing up and it's difficult to talk about it. So I think that um, for kids, the best thing that we can do for kids is to help them, you know, have those continued connections to community and culture um, and, and just do our best to keep them um, having a sense of belonging. And so what things have really changed and shifted in child welfare in the past you know, probably 20 years as we've started to um, do better by kids and families by um, reinvesting in those connections. How critical is it to the well-being of truly everyone involved that the biological family and the extended family get along? 
Well, as we know, kids have a whole host of um, developmental needs as they grow. And it takes a lot of caring adults to help meet all of those needs. Of course, there's the physiological, physiological needs of the children, you know, food, shelter, um, safety, but then there's also that belongingness that every child deserves. And that's where um, a lot of caring adults need to, um, you know, get together for the well being of that child, giving them that sense of belonging to family, whatever that means for the child. And sometimes that's somebody you're biologically related to. Sometimes that's, you know, a loving neighbor is, is somebody you would consider a part of your family. Um, just all of those pieces, the family, community, culture, all of those things are, you know, what a child needs to, to grow healthy and, and feel that safety. First of all, let me apologize. I was having some uh, technical difficulties. I hate that phrase, but for lack of a better phrase, I finally got the camera to work. So let me again say welcome to everyone. I'm Valerie Edwards, assistant editor here at Fostering Families Today magazine. We're talking with Renee Bannis from Ampersand Families as we discuss how the first family and the extended family can get along, communicate, I guess that's the best word for it, in the best interest of uh, the children we're taking care of. And just to return, Renee, this, so this shift happened, what, 10 years ago? Was it, is it as soon as 10 years ago or did it happen? Has it been coming five years ago? This seems something new. Yeah, I know in our state, in Minnesota, where our agency is based, that statutes have changed in the past 20 years to include relative and kin family <clears throat> as part of a priority for, for child welfare workers to get a hold of those family members, notify them, and also build them into the support network. So sometimes kids can't be placed with family for whatever reason, um, but we try to do our best to build those natural supports into um, the life of whatever foster family is taking care of them, whether it's a resource family or um, a relative kin foster family. Uh, a question just popped up in the, in the chat and I think now's a great time to answer it. Um, I'm using extended family, and there are some who are using resource family, and there are some who are using uh, kinship family. And we're going to respect all of those terms. And later on, one of the guests you'll meet, when he and I first spoke, he quickly corrected me and told me he considers the resource family, his extended family. And I think that's an important distinction to have because it speaks to the strength of the relationship. In this relationship, you have two families, you have a child, you also have a caseworker. What is the caseworker's role in facilitating this? Well, I like to think of the caseworker and any of us professionals on that um, child welfare team as the bridge because we're not really doing the heavy lifting that the parent is doing, the, the resource family is doing every day, um, but we're kind of joining those, those groups, um, really helping families, um, you know, work through some of those difficult conversations and, um, you know, being courageous in starting some of those conversations, even though we know that um, there's bumps in the road and that's just natural. Um, but we really try to, kind of establish that common goal, which is always that the kid or kids are going to be, you know, safe and, um, and loved and be able to, you know, have their day-to-day -day needs met, which is usually exactly what everybody wants, um, parent and resource family alike. So, so yeah, just, just being that bridge between between groups. 
Do you have any idea who around the country, what state is doing it best? Well, there is a lot of states who are doing really well right now. Um, I know some of our partner agencies, for instance, in Seattle is working hard with relative kin families. Um, when I have been on other um, networking in, in other presentations and conferences, I can just see that it's kind of just like shifting mm -hmm. throughout the U.S. in a lot of different places where people are really starting to, you know, get on board with the idea that, you know, family is, is big. <laughs> I can see a wave sort of going across the country mm -hmm. and it's shifting. If you're just joining us, this is Tough Conversations brought to you by Fostering Families Today. We've been talking with Renee Bannis from Ampersand Families in Minnesota on helping first and resource families or extended families navigate their relationship in the best interests of the child, keeping in mind the end goal, which is reunification. Right now, I want to introduce you to Leroy Pascabillo, who joins us from Washington State. Uh, in 2019, Leroy's daughter uh, was born with heroin in her system, and CPS removed her to foster care. Leroy told me he lost a lot during his 37 years of addiction, but he was determined not to lose his daughter. Leroy, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Love having you here. Kristen and Kyle Grandstand also join us from Washington State. They, the two have been foster parents for three and a half years. And during that short time, they have parented two long-term sibling groups. And I want to thank you both again for joining us for today's Tough Conversation. These two families that we're meeting became connected when Leroy's daughter entered foster care and came to live with the grandstand. So thank you all for helping this conversation evolve and helping our, our listeners learn more about how they too can have that extended relationship. Leroy is the one who introduced me to the term uh, extended family. So I really appreciate that. Leroy, I wanna start with you. Tell me what was going on in your life at the time that brought you two families together. Um, like, like you said, you know, I, I, was, I had a 37 year addiction to uh, drugs, alcohol and the street life. Um, even though I was married, um, had my own business, you know, I still did all of that stuff. I hit it pretty good. Um, after my wife passed away, I kind of went crazy. Uh, I went a little off the Richter, as, as, as some people would say, and then ended up with um, a baby girl. Uh, her mom was addicted, her biological mom was addicted to um, heroin. And, you know, I get a call one day, say, hey, you got uh, oh, a letter in the mail. I, so I went to my buddy's house, pick up my mail, and uh, here you know, I got a court date coming up. And uh, yeah, that's the way this is all started. <laughs> that was a letter from CPS? Oh, yeah. First thing came to your mind, you're thinking? Oh, God, I got a fight on my hands, you know. Um, I'm Hawaiian Filipino. I'm from, I'm from Hawaii, born and raised. And, uh, you know, back there, everything is, family is everything. So I wasn't about to give up my daughter to the state. That was just that one something that, that crossed my mind. So, you know, I've never dealt with CPS before and everything I've knew and known about it was, well, they're here to take your kid. So, you know, I was prepared for a fight and- um, You were ready to fight. I was ready to fight. You were going to fight. Whatever it takes to get my daughter, you know, I wasn't gonna, you know, let one get away. I have five other kids that are, uh, you know, that they're grown, you know, they're, and moved out on their own. You know, I've got grandkids and stuff and I wasn't letting this one get away either. And how old is your daughter now? Um, a little over three months, three years. Three years old. How did the relationship with the Grand Strands develop? Uh, I, they were just, just the beautiful people. I mean, they, they were, you know, I don't know how it was in the beginning for them, but for me, it was like, you know, 
I was angry. I'm thinking I got to fight these people for my daughter, you know, and uh, that's how I went into it. And then, you know, I went, I went to one of the doctor's appointments and it, it, this kind of, it, it changed my perspective on who they were. You know, the doctor was talking about Azalea and, and Kristen picks her up. Yeah. I'm mom. And I don't know if she slipped or, or however it came out, but that, it kind of it kind of slapped me in the face and I was like oh my god this woman is in love with my child and then you know Kyle's there and, and they're they're both taking care of my daughter while the doctor's doing their checkup and I'm just kind of like oh my god these people are in love with my daughter I'm like well oh oh my god I got a fight on my hands <laughs> they're not gonna let her go if they're in love with my kid you know it's like oh my god here we go but no I it, it it kind of changed my mind of, of stop being angry with these people. You know, they, they love my daughter. I mean, if they're calling themselves mama and dad at to her, you know, right off the bat, it's like, I don't care who you are. You know, you get a little person in your arms from day one, you're already in love. I, yeah. Unless you're an alien, you, you, you know, you fall in love with a little baby, you know? So it, it, I had to stop being angry and, you know, that then, moment for you, that moment. Yeah. You know, it just, takes me back to where I come from, you know, my culture, you know, where, you know, you don't, you know, I don't care whose house you go into back home, you know, it's if they're older than you, you're an auntie and uncle, you know, so um, I, I call, they are my extended family, you know, because the only person my, my daughter knows as a mom is Kristen and she, and she, and Azalea already knows she has two dads, you know, Kristen, so. Do you, and Kyle, do you remember that doctor's appointment? Yeah. Yeah. You both remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember it as Leroy remembers it? Uh, I would say, you know, Leroy was pretty quiet in the beginning, the first couple of times that we spent time with him. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of interaction, a couple of questions back and forth, and that was maybe about it. But... Well, with all of the horror stories, everyone has heard about folks not getting along when it comes to fostering or kinship or even adoptive, were any of you ever worried that things wouldn't work out between the two families? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. We were at first, and this was our first placement, so we really- Oh, it was your first placement. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It was. And so we had heard some of the horror stories from going through the foster parent training and like, be careful with your personal information. You don't want to give all that out there. And so at first, I think we were a bit closed off. Um, over time, that changed as we got to know uh, both of the parents more and um, also just became more focused on trying to better that connection between Azalea and her dad. But we thought it was in the best interest to, you know. And you'd heard the, you'd heard the horror stories. So you yeah, you know, there's there's things like, I mean, I have a memory from the very beginning, the first time we met Leroy, uh, Azalea was just a few weeks old and I was dropping her off at a visit and Leroy's like, can I have your phone number? And I told him no, because that's the, that's what I was told to do was to say, you should set up a burner phone or whatever, like a different phone number. You want to make sure you protect some of that personal information. And, build a and wall. I, yeah. what's that? I said, build a wall around. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that that, that's one of my biggest regrets was not just giving my phone number right then and there, because I think we could have started um, that process of getting to know each other and collaborating at, at a much earlier point if we would have been able to cut out the middleman earlier. And it, it did take time of like me trying to come up with excuses for why I, I was going to do transport to and from visit so that I could say hi and check in and see if there's any questions or anything like that to really feel more comfortable in giving our phone number and making sure that, that Leroy knew that he could reach out to us at any time outside of just the standard intervals. Well, what was the turning point? There had to have been something that a pivotal point when the two of you said, it's not working this way, let's shift. What happened? I was, um, uh, I was actually in treatment. I was in an uh, inpatient uh, treatment center, and uh, one of my parent allies come across and said, mm -hmm. "We've got this new program that we're we're, we're going to try out. It's called the uh, Family Connections Program." And uh, I was like, "And what is this all about?" She and she was like, 
it brings, the, you know, your caregivers and the bio parents together to build a relationship for the kiddos. And then I was like, sign me up. I'm all in, you know, and uh, you said, well, well, it's going to take a, it's going to take a couple of weeks to get it all put together because you are the first family to go through this. This is a, this is a new uh -oh. thing that we're trying out. And so uh, that went, you know, that, that went smooth. It, they were willing to do it. And uh, it, 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 yeah, it, and we went, we went through that and, 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 and here we are today that, you know, we still have that relationship, but the, the thing was, I was, I was always trying to figure out how I can talk to these people. I asked you to ask my, I asked my caseworker, I need their number. Can I talk to them? You know, I want, I want to, I want to see what's going on. And uh, the person that actually helped get this all started was our visit, my, my visit supervisor. This woman was amazing. She was like, you know, you can do this, you know, you can do that. And uh, you can, you can write back and forth. I'm like, yeah, but I, I, I want to talk to them. I want to know, you know, what it's all about. But when we did get to, you know, finally talk and, and get this thing, it was, it was, it was like, it was like a match made in heaven because it, it, you know, they asked questions about me and I asked questions about them and they, they, and they were like, so what about Azalea? You know, what do you want us to do with her? What do you want to feed her? What do you want to say? And, and I'm like, well, you know, all my kids, they eat whatever and stick in their mouth, you know? Um, I was giving her beef jerky at my visit <laughs> and my trip supervisor was like, you can't do that. I'm like, all my kids ate on it, you know? So, um, and then, and, and then, you know, they, they wanted to know about me so they can raise my daughter. And, and that was just like, oh my God, you know, I can't be mad at these people anymore, you know? It, 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 uh, and it just stopped. It, it, it just stopped. I, I stopped being angry and, and you know. Uh, Let me I ask you this, Leroy, Kristen and Kyle. Every relationship has boundaries. How did you guys decide the boundaries for this relationship? You know, for me, it was then when, when Kyle and Kristen said, we are here to support you in any way possible. Well, no. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> when these people, you know, uh, what's wrong with them, you know? People don't like people like me, you know? <laughs> I come from a, a bad background and they were like, no, we're here to, you know, we love her and, uh, and we want to support you too. And I, it was kind of like from that day on, it was, I told them, you know, when this is all said and done, you know, uh, um, I'm not taking her away from you. You you guys fell in love with my daughter. You had her the first 19 months of her life. Um, you're the, you're mom and dad, you know, so <laughs> it's going to be like that forever. <laughs> so now we're a family. Families have ups and downs. Families have in and outs. How's it working? I think it's working pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, both of us reach out to the other and ask if we want to get together. Um, I think I think we see each other on a fairly regular basis, and even uh, at first, I would say it was more of us uh, picking Azalea up and spending some time with her. But then it also changed into more of like all of us spending time together. So Leroy and us uh, and Azalea and our kids, you know, love to spend time together. So. It, it's you really call one another extended family. I'm sorry, Kyle. You call no, one no, another extended family. Yeah. Yeah. So in in Leroy's favor, he turned me on to the phrase, and so now I use it. Um, is do you think your relationship is unusual? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was and a quick think, answer. And I think we had to fight for it in a lot of ways, and to say like. Okay. And you know, reunification during COVID, it's just even so yeah. much more challenging yeah. than, than yeah. outside of COVID and the rules um, where Leroy was saying about how we could do visits and, and all of that. I think we would have wanted it to be a much, um, much more engaged throughout that process than we were even allowed to be. But I think that um, we had to fight to do extra visits and, and fight to have those extra phone calls. And it, and it wasn't easy, but we did have a very supportive social worker that was just like, this isn't normal. I mean, at one point I asked like, 
is there anybody anybody else we should be doing calls with? I know that Leroy has values family so much. Like, does he have other people that we should do some calls with or some phone calls with? And our social workers, like, nobody's ever asked me that before. We don't really have the structure in place to set that up. And I was like, well, we should. <laughs> we should have some, some way to do that. Renee Bannis from Ampersand Families in Minnesota. You're listening to this conversation. Are these families the exception or are they becoming the rule? Turn your mic on, Renee. Well, I guess the best answer is it really depends. So sometimes it depends on the county and how they, um, what their values and philosophy is around relative kin family connections. Um, you know, we're lucky enough to be partnering with some pretty progressive counties on that work um, where they are interested in helping resource families connect to those natural family supports. Um, that's not uh, totally widespread, though. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are still like the old school, you know, social workers who are used to um, dividing and making those hard divisions between um, resource family and biological families. Um, but luckily that is changing because as we can, we can hear from what you guys are doing within your own families is, is that this stuff really does work and um, it's not as scary as you think. Um, and you can rely a little bit on some of your professional teams when they are helpful to, uh, you know, bridge those connections for you guys. I'm going through the comments and one, someone responded, when we humanize one another, we can, that's when we work best together. I love that comment. I love what you guys are doing. You're setting the standard for how it works, how foster care can work in the best interest of the child or the children. Did it, do I understand correctly? You guys have even been on vacation together. Is that correct? No. <laughs> that was an, maybe that's coming up. Um, oh, I know Leroy was telling me in an earlier conversation that he wanted to go take his daughter to Disneyland. Um, oh, fun. Yeah. Okay. So don't tell your kids I mentioned it. We'll it. <laughs> I would say the one other piece of this is just, so we have a five-year-old biological daughter too. And, uh -huh. and you know, so she, Azalea is her sister and, and she's so attached to her. And, and I really think that her relationship with Leroy too has really helped her understand um, the process and what, what we're doing as a foster family. And so even that connection, I think, has really impacted how she has experienced foster care and foster placements and, um, yeah, just what we're doing. Just phenomenal. Oh, you yeah, are yeah. watching, oh, I'm sorry, Laura, you're watching uh, Fostering Families today as we continue our 2022 webinar series, Tough Conversations. Uh, we invite you to join our conversation today. Leave your comments in our chat room and we'll get to them. Um, we've got a lot of comments coming in, so I'm trying to uh, see what we've got. Uh, someone from, we have Danny writing. This is wholesome and awesome. Thanks for sharing. Danny, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we're talking with Renee Bannis. She's from Ampersand Families in Minnesota. She got up to be with us this morning. We're also talking, talking with uh, Leroy Pascabillo and Kristen and Kyle Grandstrand, who join us from Washington State, sharing their story of how this biological family and this resource family, now known as extended family, uh, have come together in the best interest of Leroy's daughter. She's uh, three years old now and she calls. So what does she call you, uh, Kyle and Kristen? What are her names for you? Hi, mom. And dad. Okay. And Leroy, her name for you? Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> Phenomenal. I love it. These two families successfully work together to support Leroy during his journey and his uh, his daughter as well. I, just a phenomenal story. Thank you. Stay with us. I want to introduce a team from Northern California, Jody Rogers and Robin Robbins. 
Uh, they've worked together throughout Sonoma County to support and mentor birth and foster families in building relationships with the goal of keeping, of helping parents reunify with their children whenever possible. A little bit about both of them. Uh, together with her husband, Robin Robbins, the couple has been emergency foster parents since 2008. Is that right, Robin? A little bit sooner than that. It's been almost 20 years now. And to date, you've parented 35 children and you were instrumental in bringing the innovative birth parent foster parent partnership model to Sonoma County. Jody Rogers also joins us. She is a single mother of three who has overcome a lot in her lifetime, including homelessness, addiction, and domestic violence. She became involved in the child welfare system when her three children were removed. Today, Jody works as a parent mentor at the Child Parent Institute in Sonoma County. She refers to this as her dream job. And Jody, we're gonna find out why you said that a little later. Thank you to both of us, to both of you for being with us today. Tell us how this partnership evolved and how the two of you came together to work together. Who wants to start? Robin, let's start with you. Okay. <laughs> so just to let you know, welcome everybody. I feel like um, I'm in a group of folks who really understand what I've been doing the last 20 years. I'm a foster parent. Uh, my family took in medically fragile infants. We've had 50 children in the last 20 years. You have a little bit older bio there, I think. Um, and we were recruited as often foster parents are to come take care of and keep safe little children who need love. Now that's about as far apart from what I understand the situation to be as, as could be stated. So I am here today to tell you, I um, am here to share in helping families heal. Uh, it took a little while for me to really notice that our system wasn't supporting that. And it was hard to keep a relationship with a, a birth family, even if it felt like the natural thing to do, particularly with a new mother and in a hospital setting and with newborns, you know, that's a time when it attachments a natural thing to have happen and my husband and I were were more than willing to let that happen so so it's been it's been a long time coming that we were looking for a way to be supported by the system and be able to do what Kristen and Kyle you did naturally on your very yeah. first placement are you are you surprised uh, are you gladdened uh, what's your reaction to the relationship between the three between the two families and the three of them uh with Leroy and Kristen and Kyle Yes, yeah, exactly. I'm thrilled. That's uh, it's you know it's their first placement. I don't know, Kristen and Kyle might you might just be the type of folks in Leroya also that understand humanity is where we need to go when we're working with children and families that are um, having challenges. And so it could be it comes natural to you, but it could be that the environment was just in in a place where you could naturally allow people to be people. Well, one of the things Leroy mentioned was um, that there. I'm sorry, it was Kristen and Kyle mentioned that the social worker was telling them that they were breaking new ground. You, it sounds like you two are breaking new ground as well in what you're doing in Sonoma County. Is that an accurate assessment? Come on, Jody, jump in there and tell them yeah, how Jody. we're breaking new ground. <laughs> Come on, Jody, it's your turn. Okay. Um, so can you clarify like the specific question? Are <laughs> What you two are doing as a team approach, helping resource and extended family, are you breaking new ground in child welfare? I'd say yes, absolutely. Tell um, me why. Well, when we are engaging families um, and getting them to really work alongside of each other, like that, if you take you know, the situation of being involved in the child welfare, if you, if you take, remove that, what is the most natural way we work with fam families work together, right? Like, and so we're seeing that happen here. We're watching families, birth families, resource families support each other, going to doctor's appointments together, having conversations about how their, how their day went, you know, um, making decisions together. One example I have is, um, hey, we're going to give the baby 
food for the first time? Why don't we do it in a visit together and experience that together? So it's not just a shift for birth parents and resource parents, but how awesome is it? I get choked up, but how awesome is it for these kiddos that the adults in their lives are working together? You know, and when I, so when I think of like, what is true partnership? And so what comes to mind for me is as long as it's safe, every child deserves to keep everybody in their lives who they love. And hearing, hearing the story earlier, I was like, that to me is successfully partnered. That's, that's wonderful. Okay, that's I'm going to jump in here that. real quick. So Please. tell everybody how you felt about me when you first met me, Jody. Uh-oh. <laughs> so Robin actually found me. I was a new parent mentor in our county. And I remember my supervisor told us, hey, there's a foster parent that wants to meet you. And I was just like, Ugh, no, like I still had that like separated mindset. And so when she first came to meet me, I was just super quiet. I didn't really know how to feel about it. And um, I remember thinking, I just, I got to get away from her. I don't know why. I just can't get out of this room quick enough. (laughs) Fast forward, fast forward to today. Um, How many years ago was that? uh, Six, six years. Okay, fast forward. (laughs) She's my person. Jody's my person at this point. And uh, I'll let her tell you how she feels about me and my family. So I love extended family, Lori. That's not new for us. That's what we've created in this particular relationship. But we have, we've been working on this the whole time. We work with our local partnership. We work nationally to continue to face the challenges that come up between foster parents and birth parents and how the system isn't necessarily set up to encourage our having a relationship that works for others. So um, you can ask your questions, Valerie, but I can't stop talking about Jody because um, I, as a foster parent, what happened for me is it's, it's so simple. I just had the opportunity to have birth parents humanized, and all that took is putting us I in like the same word. room. We just yeah, like had to be word. in the same room and be allowed to talk to each other. I want to ask the, the two of you, Robin and Jody, but I also want Renee to weigh in on this as well. How do you convince? a reluctant parent, either extended family or birth family to be part of this partnership? What what can you convince, or perhaps that's the correct, can you convince a reluctant party to be involved? That's a great question, if I could go first. So, you know, like at first, that was a question I think Robin and I both had, like we thought it was gonna be tougher than it is. But if I'm being 100% honest, so it, it's really on the birth parent side, I'll let Robin go for the, for the resource side, but um, it, it hasn't actually been that difficult. And so something that I do in the work I do with parents is like, I start, I'm always talking about partnership, like, hey, have you thanked them for caring for your child while you're unable to, or even if they're picking, I'm like, how is she dressed? Could you thank them for take for for taking such well care of her, like for her looking cute or any little little bits to start that relationship? But um, and then something I do is like like bringing Robin to meet the birth parent and just to kind of sit there and like engage with them. And it's just such a smooth transition that regardless of what birth parents have done you know, to get into this situation or what state they're in, whether they're sober yet or they're not, or regardless, I have, we still love our children, right? We've made mistakes and we love our children. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm sorry. I don't think that anybody could be harder, regardless of how it seems on the outside, who could be harder on themselves than we are on ourselves. And so um, I just want to, to kind of throw that out there. And when given the opportunity to be a part of anything that helps their children, oftentimes I, I see birth parents want to do that. I truly appreciate that sentiment, Jody. 
and I can tell it's heartfelt. And it sounds to me as if you speak from experience. So I truly appreciate that. Thank you for being so vulnerable with us today. Thank you. Renee, can you weigh in on that question? You work very hard to connect young people with extended bio families. How do you convince, can you convince reluctant people to become involved in this relationship? Yeah, I think that we have to assume that biological families are gonna have a little bit of reluctance going in because everybody's staring at them and writing down everything that they are doing. Um, and that's hard to be under that kind of lens. Um, so we assume that there's gonna be a little bit of reluctance, um, but then it's in the little details, especially those things that resource families are doing to like kind of just open that door for them. Um, I saw somewhere in the chat, a resource family said something about inviting the parent to the toddler's first haircut. Like those little things really matter and, kind, and can, um, just help parents get over that reluctance and bring down those barriers for them. I know we have a resource family who's keeping a little journal for the parent to read. Um, so they exchange it on visits and stuff. And it's some of the things the kid did that week or funny little things they said. And that parent is really just enjoying looking through all those little details, just feeling like they're not really missing out um, so much. And the relationship is just blossoming from there. Thank you. Robin, do you want to weigh in on that? You know, I have actually- happen, Let me ask, have you had that happen in your experience? Um, so I was busy looking at a comment in the chat. So- Go ahead. Um, okay, I just see from Sarah a situation that, um, and I love the name Tough Conversation, so I hope you were prepared for someone who likes to have tough conversations. I love it, I love it. So that is a situation that is not unusual with foster parents. So this is the one where your first impression of the birth parents um, starts out positive, but then things get more difficult and it feels like the parents aren't really able to, or for whatever reason, not, you know, doing the case plan and, uh, but still wanting to visit. I've had a lot of situations like that. And what I have learned from my support from my amazing partner, Jody, and the time I've been working on partnership is this is where I need to lean in. This is where I work really hard to just find out, okay, so what's going on? What, how, how come, you know, how are you feeling about this? What could we do to make this more comfortable for you? What could I say to the social worker that might be helpful for you? Or if that's not happening and you haven't already come up with a, a, a way to have that communication, try for that communication there, you know, because we're all human beings and we, we make up these stories in our head i think we've been forced to be divided as foster parents and birth parents and we we look at each other like monsters right and instead of human beings because of a story because of a system that's been in place so so we know better we all have big hearts we all wake up in the morning wanting to help children we're on the same team here. So that just really struck me as all of those situations are gonna continue. They aren't gonna disappear overnight, but our mindset can make a huge difference on a case like that. And you, Robin, and you, Jody, you two work together in Sonoma County. Tell me about the program that's in place there. Jody, you go ahead. Yeah, so we, um, when Robin and I had first met, well, fast forward. We, when we first met, I, I like faked an emergency to leave. But like, besides that, when we actually met again at a convening in Seattle, um, she came up to me and she said, I want to learn from you. Like, how can I be a part of helping families heal? And in that moment, I was just like, this is set up. It's just like, you know, but it was, it was incredible. And so we put our heads together on like, what if we worked together and I was the birth parent mentor for, for a mom or a dad, and she was the resource parent to a baby. What if we 
just wrapped this parent in support? What would that really look like? And so we got this idea to pilot a partnership case. And so we came back and we got, we took our idea to the county and they were like, what can we do to help? We, we support this. And so we were able to really run with this one specific case and just keep with the updates, working with the social worker. I feel like that's a key piece is like, it's, it's equally important is having that social worker right there on board. And I, and I remember her feedback was like, wow, this is probably one of the easiest cases I've ever had, you know? Um, and so fast forward, uh, this pilot is now a program and it, it does live in our department. And the name has been changed from the birth and foster parent partnership to the birth and resource parent partnership. And so what that looks like is the mentors, the birth parent mentors, as well as resource parent mentors, we meet bi-weekly and we come together. We talk about things we can do to help families. Um, an example, Robin and I are both on the, a new, working with a new family and it, it's looking like um, it's on, it's set to, to go into an adoption, but that's okay. Like it's not about outcomes, it's about relationships. And I think that we just had a great story in the beginning of this. Yeah, I think that's, that's the key word, Jody, is relationships. And right. I think that's what everyone is talking about today. Um, Jody, I want to ask you quickly earlier, I mentioned that you said this is your dream job. Why do you say that? Well, so because I've, I've had my children removed. I was addicted to drugs and an unhealthy relationship and my kids were removed and I was terrified. Um, I didn't ever at that time in my life know anybody who got their kids back. And so I was really scared and I just thought like, they didn't have birth parent mentors back then. And I was just like, I don't know how, but somehow, some way I'm gonna show the world this can be done. Like, I don't, I, I laugh when I look back at that, but in my mind, that was so real, but there wasn't anybody like there to like support me in those moments of like at the end of a visit, you know, or, just walk alongside of me and help me navigate going forward. It's terrifying, so scary. And so today I get to go back and I get to sit down next to parents and I just get to look at them and say, Hey, I've been there and like truly show empathy and then be there, walk alongside of them, be that person to help when they're crying at the end of a visit or help them figure out how to get gas instead of running 20 miles to a visit each week or you know the things that I needed so bad I get to be for families you are watching watching um fostering families today our webinar series for 2022 is tough conversations we're having a tough one today because there is vulnerability in this room People are sharing personal stories, but I think you'll agree that they're important stories as we work in, and all of us do hard work in ensuring that the best interests of the children, four, 400,000 children in foster care throughout uh, this country are looked out for. And, and I think all of us can agree, um, whether you're on the panel or you're in the chat room, that it is relationships that keeps families together, whether birth families and extended families and resource families. Um, we all, you know, you guys are doing really a phenomenal job in Sonoma County. And I wanna thank you both for sharing their your story. Um, Leave us a comment in the chat room if you'd like. Uh, you can also follow us on any of our social media platforms. We've got a great team working behind the scenes to ensure that we keep you updated on what's going on here at Fostering Families Today. I'm Valerie Edwards, Assistant Editor at Fostering Families Today, and it is a pleasure to have all of our guests here today. I wanna to invite Kristen and Kyle Grandstand to rejoin the conversation as we go into the last 10 minutes along with Leroy 
Roy Pascadillo. You guys have been, I know you've heard this conversation. I know you've been listening to, to Robin and, and Jody and, and you can see the comments that are going on. Give me some feedback about uh, what you've heard with uh, Robin and Jody. Kristen and Kyle, let's start with you. Sorry, I think for me, it's, it's about respect and meeting parents where they are. Because yes, when we have a child placed in our placement or placed in our home, it's because the biological families are probably at their lowest low <laughs> that they've been, and they're going to go up from there. So don't really, um, I guess it's like, it's looking towards the future and what, what can be and, and wanting to make sure that you're setting the tone and establishing those relationships, meeting with people where they're at, recognizing that there's room for growth and that it is in the best interest of that child that, that we love so much that they can see us all supporting them together. More adults loving on this child is what's in their best interest. Leroy, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I love everything um, Jody and Robin was saying. Uh, and like Jody, you know, I, I am that parent that, uh, um, like I said in like I said in the, um, earlier that I went through the me and my daughter, the three of us was the first families to go through this uh, family connections program here in Seattle, and. Uh, now I'm part of that. I'm part of that uh, program. Now I'm the certified lead family mentor, and I get to do the same thing Jody does. I get to help another family, walk them through this, and and and, and let them know. I started this when I was 50 years old. You know, I'm 52 now, and uh, you know, I, I I get to I get to tell my parents that I deal with that. You know, they're, they're way younger than I am, and and it's like, you know, I tell professionals that the same thing. You know, these parents started from the bottom they don't know what it's like to be on top lose it all and try to fight back I know you know my addiction was 37 years so I know what it's like to be high and low and so I know what it takes to fight to get what I want and I have that drive and I get to share that with another parent you know and, and say listen this road is not going to be easy but I'm there alongside with you to you know whatever you need you know you, you need to just call me in the middle of the night and just and, and just vent I'm 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 here you know and, and and this journey that you know that us parents do we you know some of us do it on our own and it, it is hard so having that one person next to you it makes it that much uh easier to to move forward you know knowing that you know i've i've had my extended family tell me you know we're here to support you in any way possible you know and that was a beautiful thing to hear out of their mouth and 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 that's why i call them my extended family because if I do have, if, if, if I do run into something, like I had, I had to work on, a, on Mother's Day, you know, I called them up, they were like, we'll take her, and my, my daughter, uh, our daughter was like, can I go stay with mom and dad for the day, and I was like, yes, you can go spend Mother's Day with mom and dad, you know, dad's got to go to work, and she was like, okay, and it was good to go, and, and, and that's how it, it's support, and, and, and it's, it's a relationship that, you know, it's all about the kiddo, the kid, you know, without having this relationship, you know, the, the kiddos can see, they feel you and, and, they, and they watch, you know, there's the that word again, all of that. there's you that know? word again, Leroy relationship. Let me ask you quickly, Leroy, as Jody said, best job she's ever had. Is this the best job you've ever had? Never in a million years. I thought I'd be doing this, but here I'm doing it. And, and I, and I love it. I love every minute of it. You know, I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. You know, this little girl's worth all of that. I want to ask each of you in turn, what's the first step? Renee, let's start with you. What's the first step? How do you build that relationship? First step, I yeah. guess, you know, really just come in to the table with an openness and a curiosity, um, you know, asking curious questions. Like, what does your family do for holidays? You know, what are some of your cultural traditions? What, um, you know, is one great family memory you guys have of things you've done together? And I think that's how you start learning about each other. Robin, first step. First step, but first comment. Um, I really want to jump in and react to what I just heard both the birth parent um, yes. mentors share. 
because I don't know how much time I have and I'm speaking to a lot of foster parents and I just want to, you know, remind folks that this hasn't been easy. Jody and I have done a lot of hard work and continue to. Um, we even have bumps in our relationship now and then, huh, Jody? But uh, we have such an established sense of trust, we get through it. But the part I want to bring up that I think is important for foster parents is when Jody said the social worker said um, that was her easiest case because Jody and Robin did all the work. The truth is my my job as a foster parent is much easier when I build relationship with the family. Yeah. So in our partnership, we don't look at what the outcome's going to be. We aren't focused on is this going to be TPR, is this going to be uh, termination of parental rights, or is this going to be reunification or adoption? What's going to happen? We focus on the relationship. And because of that, all the worry about visits, it's gone. All the tension about, you know, the things that make it hard, who's brought what, who's done the right thing, who's done the, you know, there's a diaper rash there, you know, all of that goes away when you have a relationship and you can communicate with each other. And it just made my job much, much easier. And it had nothing to do with the outcome. The other thing you had brought up um, was relative. And this is an area that we need to really have more tough conversations about. So in a relative care situation, like the one Jody mentioned we're talking about, um, it's different. It's a really different situation, but still focusing on building relationships, start with something simple, use first names. Um, I think I saw my friend Katie saying something about, or it might've been Jody, ask the social worker, well, how about we do this? Can I talk to them? Can I give them this phone number? You know, just ask and maybe somebody will say yes. Do, take that first step and be the person who reaches out like these amazing foster parents did and um, say, yes, I want this. And, and know that it's definitely what the children need, but it can also really make all of our lives a lot easier. It if makes we're in everything it. easier. We're almost out of time. I want to ask Jody, I, uh, Kristen, and Kyle be, real quickly. Um, any tips and advice for for families working together? Real quick, Jody. Yeah. So what's coming to mind for me as I'm reading the chat is that um, you know oftentimes parents will still be in their addiction or will be in bad situations, and just kind of keeping it in your mind that no child ever says, when I grow up, I'm going to be a drug addict. When I grow up, I want to be in a domestic violent situation. And so I, I think the reason I say that is when I say the first step, just have a conversation, right? Like oftentimes when you have a conversation, you're like, whoa, they're way more human than I had realized and I think that it takes one person to be the bigger person. And I think birth parents and resource parents are equally intimidated by each other. But I'm not saying this just because I'm a birth parent, but I think the birth parents are a little more intimidated because their children have been removed. So if you just open the door. Great. Kristen and Kyle, first step. Yeah, I would have to second a lot of the, uh, what's been said already, but it's definitely going into the situation with a very open mind. Um, you know, oftentimes birth parents and foster parents come from completely different walks of life. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to know what's in that other person's mind, what they've been through. Um, we had a lot of assumptions going into ours, and a lot of those were proven wrong, you know. And we learned a lot. We learned at least as much as we learned and probably more. But uh, it's definitely just getting to know the person. They're a human being just like you and understanding them. We are almost out of time. I want to thank each of you, Robin and Jody, Kristen, Kyle and Leroy for being vulnerable with me today. I wanna to thank Renee for her expertise, uh, for always having a word of advice a uh, support for our, our listeners, our readers of Fostering Families Today magazine. I wanna thank all of you for being so vulnerable and being so honest. Um, at a time when COVID makes us hard to connect with one another, I feel like we're connecting here. I feel like this tough conversation, we're connecting here. And I really, I truly appreciate it. Before we go, I want to let you all know there is a lot of information out there to help extended and birth families communicate, including this tip from the American Bar Association. If a child is present 
during that initial meeting between caregivers, give that child an opportunity to share additional information about themselves and to ask questions. And it goes back to what everyone is saying, communication, relationships, it's what's working. And all of you, I cannot thank you enough for being here today, for being open, for being honest, for being vulnerable. That is it for today's tough conversation. I really appreciate all of you listening and, and watching. I appreciate the comments. We couldn't get to all of them. I didn't truly expect so many comments. Uh, but I want to let you know that coming up in July, Fostering Families Today continues its 2022 webinar series with a conversation on race and foster care. You can visit us online for free, register for free for that webinar, fosteringfamiliestoday.org. And don't forget to check us out on social media as well. We are on everything that you can tweet, link, whatever it is, we're there. Big thank you to our sponsor for today's Tough Conversation, iFoster. Remember, they have a survey going on. We'll have that information available so you can check them out too. Every voice is needed in this conversation. And finally, I can't leave without thanking the stellar team behind Fostering Families today. Those of us who come together to bring you this information here in webinars and uh, in our magazine. I'm Valerie Edwards. Have a great day. Peace and blessings to each of you. So long. See you next time.